Hello, everybody, and welcome to another um, Trading Insights with FXT. Um, you've got myself, Tim Muirhead, and Michael Berman, who's the uh, CEO of FXT on the line with us. How are you, Michael? Hi, good and you, Tim. As I just said to you, I'm probably not at my best with a little <laughs> bit of either flu or the COVID, but um, we'll soldier on. Yeah, that's it. So it's look, it's the twelfth of January, about midday on on our Thursday. Sunny weather where are we am at the moment, so uh, can't I can't complain too much. But yeah, uh, and uh, I think certainly in the last sort of uh, week or so, the markets have been a lot more buoyant, which is probably um, helping a lot of people's portfolios given the terrible finish to the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so, well, I, I've seen some people call it the everything rally, like so, <laughs> everything's rallying at the moment. Yeah, so uh, I guess look, almost we'll, everything. Almost. I'll, just, I'll just give you a brief. We've got, so on today's uh, podcast, we're going to be talking about markets as we always do. Uh, we've got a uh, just a question about the jobs market in the US and what that all means. Uh, we've got a, a question about falling energy prices. What do they spell for inflation and central bank response? And our evergreen Bitcoin dramas continuing with uh, Gemini and Winklevoss and all that. So. Uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll take it there from a, a bit of a market wrap, if you like, Michael. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, look. Um, I guess yeah. End of last year, it was pretty disappointing. I guess the sense that we didn't get the Christmas rally. Uh, but look, in the last sort of week or so, um, we've definitely seen um, a lot more positive price action. So. Um, it, it uh, and it was probably at the right time too. Look, we had a Nasdaq. If you look at a log channel, I should have actually got the chart ready. But on, on a log channel going all the way back from two thousand eight, we're at the bottom of the trend, and we're worried that if uh, if it broke there, broke down, we could you know start a bit more of a cascading fall. Um, but it's look, it's held in, and um, you know Nasdaq's bounced, the S and P five hundred's bounced. I think pretty much most major markets around the world have been uh, pushing on stronger. Uh, Look, people asking for catalysts. Well, you know, I mean, um, partly just because I think the market's sort of looking that the Fed might pause and we'll get into a bit more of that. But also I think China uh, coming back online, that's really been pushing commodity prices up stronger. Uh, and just with the fact that, um, yeah, the US dollar has been dropping now. Last year, you might recall, US dollar going up. That was sort of, then the markets were going in the opposite direction. We're now seeing a bit of, US dollar weakness supporting the stocks. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess that's all been, um, you know, good, good news uh, for the markets. Uh, we've got CPI out tonight. That's obviously going to be important. Um, look, if we get a hotter number, that might sort of terminate this rally quickly. But uh, uh, a lot of the, you know, drivers for the inflation are coming off. Um, I guess the only one that's not is the labour market, which is very strong. We saw that last, uh, I think it was Thursday, just the job numbers are still pretty strong, 200,000 people added. Uh, what the market did like was the fact that the um, wage inflation is easing, although still well above the uh, Fed's target. Uh, but I won't spoil the next question since it's, a, it's been asked. Mm. But... Uh, uh, we've seen precious metal space that's been pushing on gold really outperforming. So silver's been going sideways, but uh, gold really uh, just keeps on going up. You know, a little bit each day, um, which is uh, yeah, I guess sort of been interesting. Um, and what else have we got? Um, look, just you know, FTSE 100 that's broken to new highs. Amazingly, we've got the DAX very strong. So Europe, which. Uh, you know, with all the war and all the situations going on over there, it's uh, it's been performing very well. Uh, and our local Australian market really starting to to get a bit of a bid just with all the commodities um, pushing up. And I think, yeah, it's largely also the, the banking sector has also been helping. So, look, all around um, a good week. Um, how it goes, I just uh, you hope the CPI doesn't come in too hot tonight and spoil it. But uh, I guess the main takeaway for us is just, watching how the market responds to the data. I mean, if it, if it 
if it does actually come in hot or even in line with the market can shrug it off, that'll be a really strong sign that things are bullish. Uh, and I guess we'll uh, see how it goes. I get, I'll put my pass it over to you for your thoughts, yeah. Michael. Yeah, so I'll start off with, a, you know, just a commentary on, on using my navigator on how things have got. But ju just to, before I, I begin on this, just to mention that, yeah, I haven't seen so many eyes on the CPI number coming up our time, uh, morning time in the U.S., on Thursday, um, it'll be later our time. But yeah, I, I think this is going to be a big catalyst for a move either way. I will uh, we'll unpack where a little bit later where I think it might move to. But uh, I did see some analysis I was reading earlier today that basically around the CPI prints throughout 2022 was the major driver of price action. So basically in between those um, releases, the markets did very little versus around the all the action happened around the CPI print. So um, expect expect some fireworks there. If you're talking of fireworks, if you look at year, year to date, month to date, it's the first month of the year, uh, it's pretty much been a, a, a crypto story. So yeah, I mean, we, we're having big moves today. Um, Ethereum and Bitcoin up over 4% on the day. You can see that uh, on the week, 10%, um, 8%, and then, yeah, so you can see we, we've had some big moves. You can also see the Hang Seng Index has been very strong, and I guess that's on the, as has um, the China, the mainland hasn't been as strong as as uh, the Hang Seng. I can't really explain why, but uh, I'll just say that I guess the market's starting to discount that COVID will soon be something of the past and and starting to you know look forward to some interesting things and yeah you can see the broader indexes the the nasdaq and the s p they've all been strong so far this this year what's what's actually been on the weak side is been um com some of the commodities like coffee which is interesting is as a had a um a rough time maybe people aren't ordering their lattes and cappuccinos like they were like um, uh, I, I can't, I'm, I'm not really sure what's, what's the story behind all of that. And then you see the oils, um, and the gas has been, has been a bit weak, but I know that this week they've actually been bouncing. So it was a lot weaker. Let me say it like that. If you looked on it, like from a price journey point of view, let me just show you this, um, this bottom one here is Brent. So it, it started the year off really weakly. Uh, got down to minus 10%, but it's now only sitting at minus three and a bit percent. So, you know, are we putting in a base there? Um, I'm not hundred percent sure. Just while I've got my charts up, I'll just take a look at one particular chart. The, the, the S and P 500. I just want to say that we are, are coming up against this trend line. here, this downward trend line. here. So this will be some resistance as well as, um, the 200-day moving average, and you know we we are we are pretty close there. So so um, yeah. If I, I, I put it to this way, I, I, depending on where the CPI goes, I I wouldn't be surprised if um, we start you know we 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 trend lower. So I'm bearish. I'm bearish. This bounce. I see. I see it as another you know, um, bear market rally. I'll, I'll yeah. leave it there for now. No, that's look, that's, um, and, and I guess I can probably add to that, um, which actually follows into our, um, our next question, Michael, which is uh, last week we got the jobs, uh, the market talking about the jobs report in the US. Is the market hot or not? Uh, now, um, so just um, briefly, look, the jobs came in about 200,000. I think it was a slight beat. Um, and look, wage inflation was down. We also had some um, uh, retail, so, oh sorry, PCI numbers that came out, which are actually weaker. So off the back of that, you look, the market took that as um, the Fed will be in, in a position to pause eventually. But what we need to uh, just highlight is that, um, look, the Fed said their target uh, for unemployment is about 4.6%, right? Um, they're currently at about 3.5%. So in order for them to get to their target, they basically have to shed a million jobs, 
right? Now, uh, this is, I guess, a good story and a bad story. So, look, the good news is that um, the labour market resilience is, um, you know, what will underpin the US economy. I mean, consumers are actually... Um, Look, they drop, drive about 70% of US GDP based off consumer spending. Um, a stat I saw look, um, was that last year the US created 4.5 million jobs. If you look back at the data um, through history, I think it says that um, uh, since the 1940s, only one out of 17 years that followed um, uh, that kind of job creation ended with a severe recession. So they might be up overblown and we could see a softer landing. Look, but the bad news is that um, Chair Powell's made it very clear in his last month's uh, statement that he needs unemployment to rise. Um, look, they have, uh, you know, wage inflation objectives and he's like, he's used the word pain to describe it. So we believe that, look, there still could be, um, they still could be more rate hikes in the pipeline or at least they're going to hold it higher for longer. So I tend to, I guess, agree with you in the medium term that this is a bear market rally. Um, I think we're a little bit early. I think, you know, um, markets, are, I mean, at the moment we're getting everything rally, even the junk at the, you know, the bottom, all the stuff that should be going to zero is rallying. Uh, but, you know, markets try and discount the future. They're, um, you know, they're looking forward. They're trying to work out whether inflation is actually going to come down to their target. Can they back off? Uh, so, you know, obviously it's going to be data driven. There's a lot of noise out there, uh, but we'll see how it goes. But uh, uh, so far, so good. I mean, I agree with your uh, comments about the um, S&P 500 approaching uh, some resistance. But look, just the fact that, you know, you've got markets like the FTSE breaking out, you've got the DAX strong, China's sort of really being the, um, I guess, powerhouse. Um, we could see this rally have a bit more legs, but uh, still remaining a little bit cautious and, you um, yeah, we'll, we'll see, but uh, yeah. I think... Uh, I, I don't have much... Well, what I'd add to what you just said is that... So the jobs report number that came out is is backward-looking. So it's historic and, and let's say, might be a little bit old. Um, what I'm seeing is the following is... Well, you, you've seen some high-profile companies making announcements that they're laying off people. So... Um, Almost on a daily basis, you hear in companies say that they're laying off. And, and I looked at some economic data um, in terms of forward expectations, like the, the various high profile uh, forward gauges like the ISM and, and PMI and all this kind of these, these indexes. And, and things are pretty, um, pretty pessimistic, let's say, from small business Point of view going forward um, for the for the early part of this year, so there's a there's quite a bit of negativity on 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 let's say expectations for business, and and I think that's likely to morph into more job losses. I, I think what I'd like to to take from this is that when when the top companies, the guys who actually were the most amongst the most profitable in in the last few years, are the ones that are cutting. It's normally a, a sign that good management is is getting in, and they're not, you know, falling in love with a thesis that this is, you know. I think they know things that you and I might not know from being on the ground and getting all that intel from these massive companies that they run. And uh, I mean, maybe this kind of sets up the part of the next question. But I was trying to explain to my family last night that interest rates going up make things more expensive um yes you've got less disposable income because you, you know you're paying more on your mortgage and 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 that kind of stuff but it doesn't really bite until um until you lose your job because then you know up until then it's 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 uncomfortable or you you know you're forced to tighten your belt and and all this kind of stuff and spend a little bit less but when you've got no job or there's zero income then um, things start to become quite scary and, and one tends to have to sell assets to to get the, rid of the debt that's causing the harm. So anyway, um, uh, it's not all doom and gloom yet, but I, I think I think we've had, uh, in terms of steepness with these interest rate hikes, I think it's amongst the highest steep. It's been like the sharpest raise in, 
in if you go back 50 years. So it's it's been pretty aggressive. Yes, it was off, and it was off a zero base. And I know that there's a um, to use a very eloquent term. There's a shit ton of debt out there. So um, you know, it it could hurt a lot. Which oh means- yeah, I'd have to agree there, Michael. And this and this is um, I mean we, I think we talked about this last year. Just looking um, in Australia, we had interest rates hit uh, sort of eighteen percent back in the early nineties, and people were saying, oh, you know, we've we've seen it. Uh, We've had that kind of pain, but look, the three years prior, sort of like the rates were sort of right eight, nine, ten percent. So, look, to get to eighteen percent, it's like, uh, you know, at one and a half times, um, we're a bit of a doubling, right? But uh, mm-hmm. now we've seen rates, especially mortgage rates in Australia, go from two percent to, I guess, five and a half percent. So, people just on a percentage basis, we're we're a lot worse. And this is this is get, you know same around the world. Just you know central banks financing their debt basically at zero, and now seeing uh, very um, sharp prices. So uh, look, it, it definitely is a, a factor that you need to Tim, take into the equation. Tim, can I mention something to you that uh, I have yet to see anyone mention? I actually saw it come up um, one of my alternative sites that I follow. But do you, do you know that we are about to hit the debt ceiling? On the night by the 19th of this month which no one's talking about they last year they forecast it would happen around september this year but um governments have been you know increasing their debt their debt load so that, that's going to be an interesting no one's talking about that i think that'll be a great subject for next week's discussion because because um yeah they're gonna have to, congress will have to do something i did learn something that i didn't know that if you if they hit the the debt ceiling, let's say next Thursday on on it's yeah the nineteenth, the, pre- the prediction is it will ha- happen. It it doesn't mean that they in default on any new debt or, or on debt. What happens is they have to write a letter to Congress, and then they get to invoke this fancy accounting that buys them like three to five months where they can fiddle with the numbers and say they're within their threshold. But Congress will have to make a, a decision. Otherwise, you will get... Um, and we, we, went, we went through this in 2011. I think you will you were trading then. You'll remember all the panic and, 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 uh, and, yeah, and political posturing that went with that. So next week should be an interesting week on the debt front. Uh, sounds good. I remember uh, Warren Buffett one day said, if the US real was serious about um, balancing that debt, and uh, I'd say to all the politicians, if the debt's not balanced, you know, then everyone gets voted out and a whole new set gets gets voted yeah. in. And guess what? It'd be balanced overnight. So yeah. uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, just it's a bit of a charade, this whole debt ceiling stuff. I mean, it just they keep coming up. They keep pushing it higher. I mean, the whole US, maybe we can talk about that next week too, Michael, yeah. just the fact that... Uh, the, with the interest rates going up, the US is actually going to have a problem funding itself and the fact that a lot of their, um, uh, you know, uh, people used to be buying bonds. Russia have basically stopped buying US bonds. The China yep. is uh, uh, reducing their bond purchasing. The US are basically they're, they're getting left, uh, you know, having to fund themselves these days and they, they just can't do it without negative real rates and this is a problem and it's probably why you know the things like gold have been pushing higher this yeah. to sniff this story out but uh yeah it's pro- probably another discussion yeah, anyway next week about i'll do some yeah work on the, the on that as well yeah Ab- absolutely so um anyway i guess we'll get on to our next question which is um what do falling energy prices spell for inflation uh and central bank response to falling inflation so uh, look, I guess um, in a nutshell, look, you know, energy feeds into everything. So, you know, look, if as oil price get, goes lower, you know, the cost of transport drops, the cost of, look, um, it's an input cost for to manufacturing, it's an input cost for, for loads and loads of things. So, look, you know, there's a pretty strong correlation between rising energy, rising inflation and vice versa. So as the um, oil prices has been coming off, that obviously is going to put down the pressure on inflation, which is probably a good thing. And and look, partly the reason it has been dropping, I guess, was twofold. One, we had China in lockdown, uh, which has sort of started to come out now. That's why we've sort of seen oil stabilised. 
The other is the fact that uh, the market's sort of seeing the, the US probably enter recession uh, sort of February, March this year. And, you know, with a slowdown, people just use less oil. Um, but I just saw some news hit headlines this morning that, uh, you know, Russia's basically been selling its oil off, uh, albeit half the price of what they could get it on the on the real market. But uh, US wants to shut that down. That's going to take some supply off. And, you know, commodities are always priced off the marginal supply. So, you know, you take the take some off, that's probably going to put a floor on energy. So, um, and, you know, with the, the way China is really reopening and, and perhaps, you know, as we said before, maybe the recession in the US is only going to be mild and uh, uh, probably the outlook for energy is going to be good. But uh, again, you know, um, we, we watch it closely, just to the fact that, uh, you know, it is a key input. But uh, I think, look, and I guess we can just mention too, look, a lot of the, you know, drivers for inflation, um, have been have been coming up it's just been that wage inflation which has been uh, the one because look and i guess just to explain it briefly is that you know um if people are getting pay rises then they can afford the inflation and it's sort of a psycho psychological thing you know if you can afford to pay more they can you know they keep spending so uh, it's quite a, i guess it's a um it's it's probably a not a well understood it's stood topic inflation we really haven't seen it for a long time we sort of got the first bout of it you know the last couple of years but uh, uh there are long and variable lags as we like to say and uh um a lot of these things take a while to play out and as you said michael the data we get is often uh looking you know we're looking in the rear view mirror so uh, yeah. uh but certainly interesting your thoughts yeah i i, I take note of this these sanctions that they're putting on russian um oil so there's these price caps that i think they've just they're about to be implemented um 5th of february something like that um and and you know i just did a little bit of research around the space so yeah the what what i'm told is that a lot of the fleets move in stock from russia to to let's say china and other other places um with shadow shadow fleets of of um cruise liners moving the stock so they weren't let's say um on the i'm trying to look find the, the correct word they weren't they weren't part of let's say the mainstream um the the mainstream fleets cannot get insurance and they cannot um you know they cannot operate effectively if they're not be if they're not adhering to the sanction rules so um, there's a price cap, I think, sixty dollars on 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 on, on crude. I, I can't remember which one it is, but basically, there's going to be this price cap that's put in place, and and yeah, like so that that's on Russian oil, so that no one can spend more. But but there's still going to be a huge demand for for oil, and it's likely to mean prices will go up. However, we've got as we were just discussing, we've got the world economies that are, are starting to potentially go into a global recession. We just had the IMF come out with a report saying that they're expecting a, a global recession. Uh, uh, it's not too often you get a global recession, so that's when you know most of the big economies are all aligned. Um, so this is going to be something interesting to, to watch. I think just a couple of points I just want to add that you know, caught my eye, which wasn't surprising, is that earnings per share, I'm sticking mainly to the US here when I when I speak this, but, you know, it will flow through to other large economies that earnings per share are expected by, you know, to drop significantly. Um, or let's say like this, earnings per share growth is, is expected to drop significantly. Some Morgan Stanley, for instance, is expecting negative um, earnings per share so it will actually drop not just it won't it won't be flat or, or go up marginally um which is obviously going to put some pressure of we've got interest rates that have gone up so the risk-free rate so everyone who, who did a bit of finance will know that valuations are derived by by your risk-free rate which is used as the discount factor plus a premium and and also growth um growth in in E in earnings is part of the the calculation depending on which model you use. Anyway, um, the, the so that, that that should put a 
a cap on on let's say valuations i think we're still overvalued the other the other point that i wanted to make is i saw today that the fed fund futures are discounting in the latter half of, of this year they this year they already factor in cuts 40 basis points cuts now not in the history of um the fed the from what i can remember in they they've never stopped they've never kept their hike in when the fed funds is as negative is negative real rates in other words when inflation when you subtract inflation from the it's still negative so normally it will cap it will cap um its hike when there's positive real well, real rates in the futures, uh, the, the Fed funds rate. Yeah, so, Fed, I was going to just say, yeah, Fed funds normally have to go above CPI, which is yeah, another way of saying it. That's it. Yeah, correct. They need to go above CPI. Okay, and and so my 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 take on on all of this. Yeah, here's my crystal ball long term because what's going to happen tonight? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, it's a bit of guesswork. Um, and so on. So no one does, Mike. No I, one does. I wouldn't be surprised if we we experience very similar to the 1970s, where what happened is we had that big peak in in interest rates, and uh, sorry, we had that inflation crept up 72 to 74, kind of, and then Paul Volcker stepped in, um, and they raised rates, but they 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 thought they had it, and they actually lowered rates. Because inflation was coming down, and they lowered rates, and they that unleashed unholy inflation that forced Volcker to really step step hard and you know shut it down, and that might be the playbook that I'm seeing here. Is that we've probably seen inflation drop. We've seen the energy prices been dropping, and and we've seen some commodities drop in, and all that kind of stuff. So you know if my playbook is that we're probably going to see we're probably going to see some inflation numbers that are slightly lower than forecast and people are start start going to discount the fact that fed funds are coming down or they're not going to hike anymore and we might have a little bit of a rally um and if the fed does throw in the towel early and does start cutting i think it would be a horrible mistake i think you, you, I'm just thinking. I'm just pondering. Yeah, to like. Yeah, and look, can I can I add to your story? Is that um, uh, 2024 is an election year? I mean, we know the Fed and it, look, it, it's independent of government. But look, at the end of the day, uh, yeah. they're closely tied. So you know, election year, they want to be, yeah. uh, uh, you know, dropping rates and and stimulating and doing whatever they can to get reelected and uh, you know so look absolutely that is a risk uh, and certainly I think the history shows it's not the first wave of inflation that scares people it's the second wave and um, if yeah. that does come and I, look I think that's too when um, uh, well I guess that's a look further down the track but uh, you know as the penny starts to drop to people that inflation here is here is not going away again this is why we like our precious metal story as a, a longer yeah. term play <laughs> yeah uh, you need to own real assets in times of inflation so uh, but, uh, correct because that you know if they print more money and we get this inflation it's going to be ugly and and there's our story with gold which has been a you know it 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 has been fortunately a it may be the it's on a it's on a decent size rally at the moment um let me just tell you what what it's up what's gold up this year gold is up three percent this year and was flat for for year. so you know could this be the start of a big rally interesting yeah, I mean, I think, look, um, gold was down at like 16, 20, uh, sort of in the latter parts of the, uh, the year, and now it's up to sort of 18, 80. So, I mean, sort of a, it's a pretty big move, you know, $250, uh, certainly because I need a lot of people's attention. Um, whether this is the start or whether it flaps about, look, you know, um, uh, look, it, it really does depend on the Fed and get what going and you know, going forward, and it's it's very difficult to make long term predictions. And e, and e gold, what virtual gold? Uh, what's your uh, thinking there? 
Well, we might as well get onto that. So, yeah. look, I, I will just give you some, I mean, look, um, basically, you know, crypto, it's, it's, it became crypto, I should say. Yeah, it just, look, everything went wrong. We had, you know, FTX, we've had Luna blow up, we've had, you know, Gemini, we've had all sorts of exchanges going bust, completely lost. It's, you know, down, what is it, down 75% of what from the highs going sideways, complete, everyone's lost interest. But look, in the last few weeks, it's starting to show a bit of signs of life. Now, very early days, but I think we're up eight days in a row now. That hasn't happened since um, June 2020. We're starting to break us a few, uh, a few trend lines, a few levels. Uh, and this is how these, um, you know, I guess bottoms fall and they take a while and uh, it's starting to get go. Now, I'll, I'll just put it out there. I mean, this is early days. This could just be a, a false dawn. There's been a few of them, but um, starting to show a few, few signs of life. And I guess um, just from a sentiment point of view, I mean, sentiment in the space is so negative right now. It's just like no one wants to talk about, you know, basically trading crypto. And I think if that sentiment just swings from severe negative, just even back to sort of, you know, even before, not even neutral, I think uh, it could catch a bid. And again, like we see with crypto, once it starts to go, you know, the, the momentum builds and it can definitely go a long way. So um, watching it closely, um, again, keep your money away from the exchanges, you know, cold wallets, all that kind of thing. You need to know what you're doing. So, um, but it's yeah. certainly... Is, uh, that, is that yeah. Isn't it a good lesson for um, what you're just saying there for let's say newbie traders or or even seasoned traders because we we tend to forget this is that bottoms are made when there's blood in the street and no one there's no one left to sell effectively and you know a few people start buying and the price edges up and as you say when sentiment's so negative and and yeah i looked at a, quite a few of the different crypto charts um and it has all the makings yeah this could be a false a false start um, and we could, you know, continue down uh, late in the year. We could make new lows. But I will say it has all the lookings. It has all the ingredients um, for this to be the major bottom and for it to actually now start a major, a major new rally. Um, or let's say going to a new bull phase. So yeah. it, it, it's interesting. And it's the same on the other side when when markets are so frothy and so when everyone is bullish then there's no one left to buy and that's how uh, a top like sets in and suddenly before you know it um there no, be no more buyers the price starts coming down and people yeah and, and so the cycle goes so markets work in in that form go from overbought to oversold and oh absolutely yeah and uh look i i think you're right i mean um look it, the lessons we've learned, um, I guess, in the last sort of six months is you've got to, you know, uh, having your money on exchange, um, especially one of these crypto ones that are not regulated. I'm not, I'm not talking about FXT, which is a regulated one, uh, but having, you know, you've got these things in Cayman Islands or who knows where they are. When they go down, they're just gone. You've got no chance of getting your money back. Um, so... Uh, and look, I guess the other one, just like with, we've seen with Gemini, you know, you're basically loaning your crypto out to get a yield. When the, when the yields yeah. seem too good to be true, well, you know, they probably are and it turns out they were. And, uh, uh, you know, I guess a lot of lessons, hard lessons are going to be learned by a lot of uh, investors, which is unfortunate. But uh, this is as well, old what, as... What, the, what, what's your thinking with the Winklevosses? Like, because, you know, my, they promised their clients 8%. In an environment, I guess, where they were get clients were getting zero from the bank, so because you know dates eighteen months, let's say. So, um, do you think there's culpability on their side? I mean, they're going out hard for this um, digital uh, crypto D. Uh, what is it called again? D D R C or D C R? Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That's right. it's, a, it's a three letter document. It's digital coin and token, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's right. Um, 
Yeah, look, definitely, I guess the Gemini brand has been severely damaged. I think, um, you know, the Winkle Vosses themselves, they're going to try and uh, shift the blame. But look, at the end of the day, you know, if you're offering a product to your clients and it goes belly up, you've got to share some of the responsibility, I would think. So they won't walk away completely scot-free. But um, yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I say to people, you've, you know, you've You've really got to, um, you know, own your, your, your business or your investing decisions. You've got to know what you're investing in. I mean, everyone's always said cryptos are quite a risky space. Uh, we, you know, we're finding out just how risky it can be, uh, which, you know, unfortunately, obviously. And look, I know a lot of people, especially when they're young, it's the old YOLO. Uh, you only live once, th throw everything in, they've lost it again. Well, you know, they've got time to start again. Uh, I guess the older and wiser um uh, certainly wouldn't have put all their money in it you know the old saying there's 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 old traders there's bold traders there's no old bold traders yeah. we've uh, we've we've seen this too many times before you know exactly um, that's it, right it, so yeah if i can just add um just my final thoughts on on the on this is you know i at one stage i followed the winklevosses on on twitter and i actually had to unfollow them after a couple of months, because through the crypt, through the crypto mania, these guys were cheerleaders like I have never seen. It was it was nauseating to the extreme. Basically, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. when when it dipped a dollar, uh, I, I'm exaggerating. When it dipped a few, they just said, "Load up the truck. This thing's going to the moon." They were so irresponsible, as yeah. far as I'm concerned, and they forget that all that. Yeah, and look, I mean, we're running low on time, so sorry to cut you off a little bit, bit there. But um, so the Winklevoss bosses were on it. I saw them doing an interview once, and they were saying, like, the outlook for gold is terrible, and the reason why is that we're going to start mining asteroids uh, for their gold, and that'll just over... And it was just, uh, like, if anyone wants to work out the cost of trying to get rockets into space to try and find an asteroid and shift it and then you know, have one coming in at the atmosphere at eight kilometres a second. Uh, it's not exactly uh, something that anyone's going to let you do. I mean, it was yeah. just outrageous and that it was a nonsense. They knew it was a nonsense. And these guys are from Harvard, right? They are smart guys. Yeah. They know it's a nonsense. They're just spreading, I guess, fart about other things. I, I think, you know, it, as you say, completely irresponsible. Um, yeah, oh, look, I don't really want to say whether they should or not, but look, you know, at the end of the day, they're not going to be scot free, and uh, you know, but, I think. But I think to... Tim, what, what, that, that's I think the value in what we try and give out between the two of us talking, being experienced practitioners, is that we we give in a best um, understanding. There is no absolutes. No one knows what the future on these prices are going to be. So in anything, so anyone who tells you. It is going to this guaranteed. You've got to be very, very skeptical of, and I think that's something you and I try and keep our, our heads. You know, um, it, we can make a we can make a prediction, but it's never hundred percent. It's we've got a strong feeling. That's I think that's the message we want to give to our listeners. Yeah, that's right, and that's probably a good note to edit on, Michael. So uh, we'll leave it there. So uh, yeah, you've had me, Tim Muirhead from Arvadine, and we've had Michael Berman, who's the CEO of F. XT uh, another week and uh, look uh, so we've got some questions self generated this time for next week we'll uh, so yeah. hopefully it can be an interesting show so uh, thanks everyone for watching Th Leave thanks your everyone see questions and week. comments below and all that as you normally say yeah. and uh, we'll see you next week thanks see you next week cheers bye.